uh, we're finishing the series on hold fast. Um, I think this will be the last one. We'll we'll see how that goes. But um, I expect it to be. We've spoken in the New Testament about hold fast uh, from various perspectives, just looking at all the places in the New Testament where this word for hold fast occurs and the idea of not letting go, you know, uh, a fastener, something that doesn't turn or twist or uh, come undone easily. And we as Christians are to hold fast to many things. Today we're looking at holding fast to the traditions, maintain the traditions. What traditions? Well, one of the things that I see Paul saying in more than one place, I think it feels to me like verse, which is I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. It kind of feels like verse there, that there's this uh, clear step what Paul got and handed to us was something that he got from God, not something that he made up or that he heard from some other men. And the significance of that is that because it came from God, the significance of that is that it's binding. It matters. You know, that's the important thing. That's the thing we should pay attention to as uh, Peter would put it, as to a light shining in the dark place or a river in the desert. But here we consider the source and um, I think that's an important thing. Where does a thing come from? When we speak about maintain the traditions, we are referencing uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 1 and 2 in which Paul said this, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. You know, this idea, when we say consider the source, well, what is the source of these traditions? And what is the source of our commendation? Well, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So he is imitating Jesus directly and this thing that he delivers to us is what he got from Jesus. So when we imitate him, in some sense, we are actually imitating Christ. By imitating him, we mean keeping his writing here. Of course, we don't know Paul. We don't know anything about him in terms of the flesh. So we're not actually imitating Paul. We're imitating these writings the way that he lived, the way that he conducted himself as an apostle. But in this, he is imitating Christ. And this is what we are to maintain, the traditions as delivered. We are to hold these, hold on to these, or hold fast to the traditions. Uh, it is specific traditions. They're the ones, he says, even as I delivered them to you. It's not just tradition. <laughs> Our service isn't to tradition. Um, it is to the traditions. Which ones? The ones I delivered to you? Or which are they, right? What is the source here? Well, that's where Luke comes in and I think is important. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And this um, realization hit me only relatively recently, I should say. But you have to read between the lines on what Luke is saying. Uh, it's, you know, what Luke is saying is that there are many would-be Bible authors. Even in their time, there were people writing and professing to be writing scripture, if you will. And while he agrees that it would be good to have an ordered um, you know, if you will, historical or chronological narrative of what took place and, and in what order. Um, he himself doesn't author any material. <laughs> he said, well, we have his gospel. Right, but look at what it, what it is. He said, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. 
It seemed good to me also. Now stop for a moment. Listen to what he said. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. That's a contrast. There's a difference between somebody who is a Christian or maybe an historian saying, I'm compiling a narrative of what has happened in the churches and the eyewitnesses and ministers of the word who delivered them, which is the same handed them, you know, handed them over to us. Those are the traditions. Because of the, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Meaning Theophilus, whoever this is, if it's a person named Theophilus, let's call him Theo, right? but uh, if not, it, it could not, it could be not a person, you know, this is, this whole letter is in Greek and Theophilus is just a Greek word, which means somebody who is a friend of God, somebody who, who loves God. Um, so it could be anybody who wants to know about God, who's reading the book of Luke, um, which includes his gospel and the Acts. But he says, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Let's have a narrative of everything that happened in order so that you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. This is the important thing. There is certainty in the compilation that Luke makes versus the content of apocryphal writings. That's what he's getting at. You've maybe been taught a lot of things. And lots of people who had something to do with this have written lots of things. But there's one that matters. Those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. And those Luke takes and puts them, arranges them into order. That you may have certainty. So the certainty is... Uh, not so much because we're confused about, uh, you know, the order of events in the history of the church. What he's saying is, you can know the difference between scripture and what people made up. That's what he's getting at. This is the real thing. The certainty that you get from the compilation of Luke. See, he didn't write it. He said it'd be good to have an ordered narrative, but he didn't write an ordered narrative. Instead, he compiled the record from the eyewitnesses and the ministers of the word. This is what he's saying. You gotta read between the lines just a little bit, but go back to it and see if that isn't so. It's clear to me that's what he's saying. Oh, lots of people have tried to put a narrative together, but you know, there are people who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word and delivered it to us, right? Implying maybe we should ask them, you know what, I'll do that. And here you go. <laughs> That's what Luke's doing, okay? Just to understand the reason for this though, when we talk about keeping or maintaining the traditions, I have not defined it and I meant to do that, sorry. But it's this word delivered. This word means handed over, given over, but handed over, you know, uh, would be a good, it's probably be the best translation actually for us. It is a word that, well, that means hand over. And that could be, um, you know, passing something along. <laughs> um, or it could be betraying somebody, or it could be turning somebody into the authorities. It's it, every sense in which we say hand over, they also said hand over. These are handed over to us. When we say delivered to us, we mean handed over. They, they've been, you know, from the apostles, from the witnesses themselves. Here you go. There's no intermediary with that regard. 
Um, that, that's what we're getting at. And the reason why that, uh, uh, that's why it applies in this place. So now we go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and keep going on this idea that handing over or that, you know, whatever you want to call that, that's the word that's translated tradition. And it's, you know, the word that they use in multiple places, like I say, for, you know, betray, turn in, whatever you might call it, keep tradition. But 1 Corinthians 15, he says, by way of reminder here, uh, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you now stand, and by which you now are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed it in vain, this gospel that I preached to you, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. <clears throat> That is one of those that just doesn't, it's just not that idiomatic for us. <laughs> He's saying, I didn't make this up. I handed over to you what was handed to me. <laughs> when you consider the source, the source is God. This isn't, you know, somebody's commentary afterward, somebody's teaching afterwards, somebody that Luke described who maybe was a part of this, who was a Christian perhaps, but is not an inspired author. That's not what you're getting here. Which is why he's saying to them, look, this is critical. You must hold fast to the word that I preached or you have believed in vain because what I delivered to you as of first importance is what I received. The significance of that is it's not my word, it's God's word. It's so important that you remember that because it's not my word, it's God's. That's why you have to keep it. That's why you have to obey it. That's why you have to hold fast. Well, and he talks about the transmission here in 7 and 8, you know, that Christ appeared after his resurrection to all the apostles and last of all to Paul himself. So that in the 11th verse, he said, whether it was they or I, so we preached and so you believed. It's the core, if you will, the, the foundation of the truth here. It came by revelation from God to his apostles who wrote this down, handed it over to us. That's what we've got. Now, I understand we've made copies of those documents. Yeah, okay, that's fine, I don't care. But they're copies of the same document. The origin is the same. The transmission is the same. The Lord gave it to his apostles who gave it to us directly. That's why it's critical because it is of the Lord. Now in 2 Thessalonians, he speaks about it in this way, which also taps into what Luke said. Here, they apparently are being troubled by some teaching about how the world's going to end, and, and he's trying to set that um, aright. And he says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or by spoken word or, or letter seeming to be from us to the effect the day of the Lord has already come. <clears throat> 80, 70. <clears throat> um, so, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by spoken word or by letter, verse 15 says. Uh, and I kind of jokingly refer to the 80, 70 people because that is just the craziest error you've ever heard in your life. But it's out there and it's taking churches, large churches. It is the craziest thing. But the Bible is very plain. Anybody coming with anything they got, spirit, spoken word, letter that seems to be from the apostles themselves to the effect the day of the Lord has come? No, wrong. That's not right. <laughs> if you're going for that, you're way off, way out. I don't know how to help you, frankly, because you've rejected the spirit of the Lord in his word. But the 15th verse contrasts with the second verse of 2 Thessalonians 2 in exactly the way that Luke 1 um, introduces to us. There's a difference between letters 
or spoken words or spirits, you know, that come and claim apostolic authority. There's a difference between those and the real thing. He said, you stand firm and you hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, whether by spoken word or by letter, you know, when they were there in person or whether they received this letters, they're the same, it's the same content. But whatever that might be, those are the traditions that we're talking about. It's not about, you know, where people stand or how many of this you do or what you're supposed to wear or what time of year. It's not a human tradition. <laughs> when they say traditions, they mean the Bible, the teaching of God. And again, it's a critical matter. The fact is that these traditions are binding. A failure to keep these traditions means guilt before the Lord God. Our souls are in jeopardy. You got two places, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 Corinthians 11. Both of them um, point out this criticality. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, the apostle says, We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you keep away from any brother who walks in idleness, not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. Now, specifically, the tradition that he's talking about is what he details here later, saying, um, even when we were with you, we used to tell you, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. That's what I mean by walking in idleness. They're walking in idleness because they're not working. They're supposed to be working. If, you know, if you're an adult, if you're of age, you're supposed to be working. Provide for yourself and for your family. And if you're not willing to do that, the Bible says, if anyone is not willing to work, neither shall he eat. And if you're not willing to do that and you're a member of the church, then we have a commandment in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to keep away from you. The tradition that was received from them was in their spoken word saying, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. It is the teaching of God that we must work. But it's also true that they themselves lived a life that showed that they worked very hard. While they were in Thessalonica, Paul was working uh, making tents with uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. <clears throat> you say he was very tired after work because it was intense. Oh, you have to though. Um, but he would nonetheless preach at night and on the weekend. <laughs> and that's something that he described in Acts 20 as working very hard in this way to support the weak. Um, they needed help at Thessalonica. So by no means did you look at the way that the apostles conducted themselves and decide that, oh, well, you know, it's okay if I'm not working. <laughs> no, Paul worked two jobs at once. Don't even try it, is <laughs> what he's getting at. <laughs> Don't even try that. Where did you get that from? Which is back to consider the source, isn't it? First Corinthians 11, he says, about the Lord's Supper in the following instructions, verse 17, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. Well, they're coming together and it's for the worse. What, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the 20th verse. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper. They call it the Lord's Supper, but it's not. This again is back to the authenticity of it. Is it real? Well, how do you know if it's real? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? Verses 22 and 23, no, I won't. Because I received from the Lord what I delivered to you. So again, the significance of this is they cannot be commended in the practice that they have that is wrong. They cannot be commended in it because what he gave them was not a suggestion. It was delivered from the Lord. I received from God what I gave you. It's not Paul's word. You can disobey Paul if you want to, but you can't disobey God. And that wasn't my word. It was God's word. So if you're doing this and you're not partaking in the manner that is prescribed in scripture, that's the 27th verse. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. It's an unworthy manner. You know, people sometimes think, well, you're supposed to be worthy before you take it. That, that's not possible. 
You can't be worthy of the sacrifice of God. That's not possible. No, it's talking about the manner in which they take. They have to do it the way that God said to do it. That's what's worthy. What's befitting the king is the honor due to the king, obedience to his commands. But he says this is guilt. Guilt of the body and the blood of the Lord if we don't keep the tradition that was handed to us. He said, what, I, what was handed me, I handed you. It's a hand-me-down. You, say, you got a hand-me-down Bible. <laughs> but it's true. We got it directly from God. All right. <clears throat> now we talk about this, which is also hold fast. In 1 Thessalonians 5, we introduce the topic of test everything. You know, this is just not the way that people want to be um, in the world today, I know. It's just not a thing, you know. Uh, people say, well, I, I, you know, I'm tired of that, or I don't want to I don't want to have to deal with that. I don't want to put up with that. You're just going to be against it or whatever. You know, people get tired. <laughs> but the scripture says what it says. First Thessalonians 5, 20 to 21. Don't despise prophecies, but do test everything and hold fast what is good. If you study prophecy in the New Testament, you realize that it's what we call preaching. Um, they needed a measure of the Holy Spirit at a time when the word of God was not yet completed among them. We don't. So when we are preaching the gospel, um, that is uh, the, the completed, you know, that's the real thing that replaced what they did by prophecy. So he's saying, don't look down on teaching. It's good to be taught. But do test everything. It's good. We have a, a respect for our leaders and our teachers, and, and we uh, approach it in a way that it's important. But we also test everything. <laughs> Make sure that it's right with God. And then what is good, you hold on to. Hold fast to the thing that is good. And if you've been a Christian for a while, you realize that you have to hold fast to it because there's just hardly any of it that's good. <laughs> there's just hardly any that's good. You've got to hold fast if you have it because there's just not much out there that's, that's worth holding on to. And 1 John chapter 4 says the same thing, beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Many false prophets or preachers, we might say, have gone out into the world it's true in the days of John the Apostle. You know, people say, you hear it sometimes, the, the wistful uh, desire, the, the, the uh, call for, uh, if only Paul could be here to settle this for us. You know, or I wish we could ask John what he meant by this, you know, kind of thing. People talk that way. Um, but, you know, they're, they're wrong. It wouldn't help. He said, well, I think it would if Paul were here and he said, this is what I meant. No, it wouldn't help. Because look, John is alive and writing. And he says, many false prophets have gone out into the world already. There are already people that don't listen to them. Have you read Paul and looked at how he said? Well, you know, his letters are weighty, but his speech is contemptible. You know, just, no, they didn't listen to them any more when they were alive than they do now. It's not different. But he says, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God. It's important for us to put everything to the test and know what is this thing that, that we are about to lay hold to. Who, you know, what is the teaching that this person does before we bring them here? Or what is the teaching this person holds before they become members here? Or whatever it is, it all has to be tested first. And as for you, when you are a person who uh, is moving, relocating, whatever, and you're looking for a place to be a member, you should be testing them too. For example, if you show up at a place and nobody asks you any questions, don't stay there. 
Why do you want to be in a place where nobody tests anything? What else got in there? He said, well, I'm not doing anything. I know, but what else did get in there that's bad? That they asked no questions about? You got to think about it. Do you really want to be a part of that? Man, who needs more problems? <laughs> How do you know the Spirit of God? Well, it's this. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. What does it mean to confess that Jesus has come in the flesh? Well, it means that he had a body as you and I have a body. Okay, so what? Well, it's not an academic exercise. I know everybody wants this to be about the Gnostics, and it's not. It's about the Baptists. For him to have come in the flesh means the body is capable of obedience to God, even perfection. Jesus did it. That's what it means. A spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is a spirit that requires you to obey. And you say, but I can't. And it's, no, you're wrong. You can. Jesus proved it. You can obey. You can do right. And you must. You're accountable for doing so. Every spirit that doesn't confess Jesus is not from God, but is rather the spirit of the opposite of Christ, which is Antichrist, untranslated, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. It's already there. There's John the Apostle, and he's saying very plainly about this, but they're still out there, and they're still saying, well, no, you don't have to obey. Because reasons, you know, <laughs> flesh is inherently sinful or, you know, uh, spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, you know, taking that out of context completely. And all these things that the world does. No, if the doctrine requires obedience in the body today from you, that is the doctrine of God. Every doctrine that makes it okay to sin is of the devil. That's pretty straightforward. And you have to listen carefully but if you're listening and you realize that the basis of this teaching is that we can't know what is right or we can't do what is right, well, that's false. This is what is wrong with, well, the overwhelming majority at this point of the non-institutional churches of Christ. Most of them do not believe that we can all understand the Bible alike. They don't accept that the Bible could be understood. Well, that's not confessing Jesus has come in the flesh. Did he understand what God wanted him to do? Well, of course. Well, that's because he was the son of God. Well, no, he came in the flesh. And Hebrews says that he's a perfect mediator. What kind of a mediator isn't like us? Are you undo anything of what Jesus did or you take it away from applying to us, you're undoing his mediation and the effectiveness of his sacrifice. You see why that would be the opposite of Christ. He didn't come into the world so you could keep sinning. He came into the world so you could stop sinning. Colossians 1. Uh, all right, so Colossians 1, verse 26. The mystery hidden for ages and generations now revealed to the saints, the saints to whom God chose to make known how great among the nations are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there was a mystery for ages, for generations, but it's now revealed. What is this? It is to make known how great among the nations are the riches of this glory. The glory that is Christ among the nations. It's not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. which he continues in chapter two. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for others. Everybody, he says, who has not seen me face to face so that their hearts may be encouraged. It's an interesting thing to think about that Paul writing uh, Colossae is writing saying, there are people who have never met me. I'm writing this letter and they have never 
seen me before. I've, not, I've never met them face to face. The significance of that is what we were saying earlier. Consider the source. Well, whose word is it then? When Paul's letter arrives, is it the word of God or is it the word of Paul? And that's where the fourth verse continues. He wants them to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery. All right. The thing that we talked about just a moment ago, Christ in the nations, the hope of glory, not just a Jewish thing, but for all the world. And when he says they are to reach the, all the riches of full assurance of understanding, you know, this goes back to what Luke said. You can have a certainty based on the testimony of eyewitnesses and of apostles that was handed over in this document. They at Colossae can reach full assurance of understanding. Now, in the eighth verse, he said, I, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in the spirit. So his writings are there. I'm sorry, that's the uh, that's fourth verse, excuse me. The eighth verse is the, the, uh, the next thing. But what he's saying here in four... Well, I got lost, didn't I? Give me a second, sorry. Yeah, okay. Right. We're at uh, four. Ah, yes. Uh, it, I say this so that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Plausible arguments. This is what we were saying earlier, test everything. Though absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, right? Paul's been absent in body the whole time that I've been a Christian. <laughs> He's only present with us through the writing. Right, and the thought continues. In the sixth verse, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. The way that it was delivered to you at Colossae is what you should keep doing. What are we talking about? We're talking about something very specific here, which is after the apostle came through and taught the gospel to them and they obeyed the gospel of Jesus, being baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins, then some other teachers came and they wanted to bring Jewish law, mosaical law upon these people. Kosher eating, circumcision, you know, the whole gamut. Which is why he says what he does in the 16th verse. I'm sorry, in the 8th verse. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elements of this world, not according to Christ. There's a human tradition that we are not to hold to. We started the lesson with maintain the traditions, hold fast to the traditions, and that's true. But which traditions? Well, the traditions of the apostles. What was written down by the eyewitnesses, or those who interviewed them in Luke's case, and the, and the uh, apostles themselves. That's what you hold fast to. That's the tradition to keep, not the human traditions. In Colossians 2, the imposition of those Jews who had obeyed the gospel. But by this, we are taking captive philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, elements of this world. It's just whatever works, man. They just bring things that are not the word of God, but they seem to work. Philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, elements of the world. It's just the way things are. Whatever it is that you want or whatever it is that you like, that's what they offer. And that's how they get you to leave the basics of the teaching of God. Specifically, again, the law, which is why he responds the way he does in the 16th verse. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink 
or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These things are shadows of what's to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. By which we mean those are the shadows. The thing that casts the shadow is Christ. And yes, uh, if you want, and, and I'm sure that this is right, it's a reference to Plato and, you know, the analogy of the, the allegory of the cave, right? In uh, Plato's Republic, you know, where, they, where they're uh, only able to see shadows on the wall of what's happening in life above, uh, outside of the cave, and they try to describe it to people. Which, you know, people read in the most mundane of ways, but it's clear what he's trying to say, and I think Paul's got it exactly right. <laughs> Those are the shadows of the things to come, not the reality that casts the shadow. And so, in the 20th verse, he concludes this. If with Christ you died to the elements of this world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Like, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they're used. According to human precepts and teachings. Good question. But what he's getting at is, look, this, you know, you've obeyed the gospel in Christ Jesus, and we never mentioned to you kosher eating or, you know, unclean animals, our, our new moons and Sabbaths. Why didn't we mention that? Because it's not part of the gospel. You don't need that to be saved. So why, having been saved by the Spirit in Christ Jesus, are you now acting like you still live in this world and you know the food or, or the, the substance of you know some dead thing somehow affects your soul it doesn't do not, do not handle do not taste do not touch referring to everything that perishes while while being used we don't mean it's okay to engage in fornication you can't get that out of this passage or any other he's talking about food and animals and things like this. That has nothing to do with whether you're spiritually clean with God. How is it that you think according to human precepts and teachings? How did you get here? And that's why we're talking about this. When he says test everything, that's what he means. How did they get here? Why did they accept this? Don't be taken captive by human philosophy, plausible arguments. Go back to the Bible. What, is it, what does it really say? And that's the thing that you must insist upon. In fact, you must hold fast to that. Now, 2 Peter says similar things. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2, he said, False prophets arose among the people. False teachers will be among you. Those who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing them on themselves, uh, Swift destruction, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth is blasphemed. It's true. The false teachers that we read about earlier in 2 Thessalonians, for example, um, in 1 John 4, these things, they're real. That's among the churches today, and it brings destruction, and the way of truth is blasphemed, and a lot of people are led astray by this. The 19th verse is where we get into the idea of hold fast, and of tradition. 19 to 21, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. If after they've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again become entangled in them and overcome, well, the last state has become worse for them than the first was. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness. Then after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment, Hand it over to them. <laughs> There's your word. We received the word of God. It was handed to us. When you read the Bible, you're reading what the apostle wrote down, the apostle who got it from God. Or you're reading what the eyewitness wrote down, the person who actually saw this happen. You're getting it from God. It's being handed to you. That's the significance. And Jude says the same thing. Third Peter 
Jude, same thing. Verses three and four, beloved, though I was eager to write about our common salvation, I found it necessary instead to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all handed over to the saints. It was handed over. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, any kind of a uh, change of guard, you know, you hand over the reins, right? You hand over the wheel. This has been handed over, not that we um, take the place of God and make decisions about how it's done, but that the word was given to us. The apostles, they're gone. Their lives ended, their work on earth is done, but their word is with us. It's been handed over and we have to contend for it. Jude says, we're not doing what Peter said. In fact, what I'm seeing, if you will, certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our master and Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's just 2 Peter 1 and 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He said, I, I can see that this is what's happening. We're not doing what he said, which means the faith once for all delivered to the saints is not being held on to very tightly. That's the meaning of hold fast. That's all he's getting at. Well, I do want to give you this thing. In Romans 6, we'll bring this to a close. We won't read all of these things, but I do want you to uh, see the one verse that is rather important um, to our point today. It is there um, where he says, Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, which means um, bond servants of sin, have since become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Well, this word committed is actually to which you were handed over or betrayed, but handed over. And the interesting thing about this is that uh, there's actually, uh, and it's the same word as our word for tradition that we're, we've been talking about, or hand over, pass down, uh, betray perhaps, give up, uh, turn in, commit to, as in I give up, I commit myself to the authorities. That's what it means by commit here. Even though we look at that and we think, oh, this is about commitment. Well, it's, all, it's good to be committed as a Christian, <laughs> but that's not what it means at all. What it's saying is, you've been handed over. Well, who handed you over? Well, you did. You said, I surrender all. I'm a slave of God now. That's what this is. And there's a technical meaning uh, of the term. Um, it is used in the context of slavery for giving up a slave to be examined, like a runaway slave, turning that person in. So it's saying that you have turned yourselves in to God. <laughs> You've been examined by the word of God and having been set free from sin, you become bond servants of righteousness. That's the wonderful thing. Now we think about the terrors of being a servant or a slave who gets turned over or handed in to the master. But in this case, you have been set free from sin. You, because you repented and brought yourself into submission to God's will, he forgave and you are a Christian now. And you are now a servant of righteousness. If you obey, if you hold fast. And that's the end. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian that you might have the forgiveness that we're talking about the blessings of the grace of God, that you might be forgiven, that you might walk in newness of life, that you might have burdens lifted because you know where you're from and where you're going. You know how this world will end and the judgment of God is sure. And it's based on how you yourself behaved. It's entirely in your control. Nothing else is, frankly, but whether you do right is entirely up to you. You decide whether you will do right or not, and God in his grace will forgive you. We have water here prepared that you might be baptized in his name if you need our help with that. If today as a Christian you have not um, been living right, well, it's time to repent. 
Hold fast to what you have seen and heard. Hold fast to the words of the Bible as the traditions of the apostles are our life. And do not incur blood guilt, but give it its appropriate emphasis, its appropriate importance in your life and in the lives of those who are in your charge. If today you need the gospel, uh, to, you need to obey uh, in baptism or you need our prayers, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing. <laughs>